Wonderful. Uh, hello, everyone. Well, welcome to um, uh, the uh, MedVR um, uh, talk series. Um, I um, uh, want to um, uh, uh, want to welcome you in particular to this FDA update. Um, uh, this uh, panel was originally given at the MDIC uh, FDA forum uh, uh, in in April uh, uh, in, um, in in Maryland, uh, and it shows, I think, the depth and the breadth of the capability of um, uh, the FDA to uh, understand various um, uh, specialties within healthcare as, as it um, relates to um, uh, to to, uh, uh, to medical XR applications. Um, I just want to uh, take a moment. Um, uh, MedVR is a is an accelerator located in Boston. Uh, we uh, uh, we are uh, scaling ourselves to um, meet uh, uh, meet the demands of 2025, which is to uh, host the innovators uh, like we have in in this talk series. Um, uh, we also run uh, regular talks like these. If you visit our website. Uh, you'll note um, uh, that uh, we have um, uh, have over 50 talks uh, that are uh, recorded, uh, all on the same topic of uh, the uh, uh, the journey of the uh, medical XR uh, innovator. Uh, in 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 particular, uh, you'll note we've had a number of talks um, uh, by. Um, by the FDA, we're, we're, we're very grateful for their support, uh, um, uh, both from uh, MedVR standpoint and from our community standpoint. Um, I think the, the most important thing uh, is, is that uh, uh, people, uh, innovators understand uh, uh, the regulatory process so that it's, it's, it's not a, um, an obstacle uh, but a, a, a project step uh, that needs to be take, taken in uh, as they uh, uh, as as they as they move forward. Um, a couple of housekeeping um, uh, points. Uh, you'll notice on the bottom that there is a QA uh, chat and a uh, and another chat. Uh, the QA chat is there um, uh, to put your questions. Uh, this is a, a very packed uh, agenda. Uh, all the speakers have agreed to stay an extra 10 minutes. So uh, we're going to uh, go until um, uh, till 1.10 uh, Eastern time, uh, uh, which will give you a chance to, um, uh, to, to, to ask some, some of your questions. Uh, I'm going to turn, turn things over right now to Ryan Bean, uh, who's the moderator. Uh, he is a, a physicist in the Division of Imaging, Diagnostics, and Software Reliability at the FDA. Uh, he uh, uh, received his PhD in op optics from the University of Rochester, um, uh, ad advised by Lucas uh, Novotny. Um, he, uh, uh, he's, he's received a number of, uh, of awards, um, uh, as well as um, a fellowship with the National Institute of Stan Standards. Uh, we have um, uh, a, a, a very august uh, group of people. So uh, going through the um, uh, all of the uh, uh, the resumes is not possible. Uh, you can look it up on our, our on our web website. With that, I'm going to turn things over to, uh, to 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 Ryan. All right, Steve. Thank you. Appreciate um, the introduction and giving us this opportunity. And it's an honor to be the moderator for this panel. I have to do the obligatory check. Hopefully people can see my screen. Um, so in this session, we are uh, fortunate enough to be hearing from a number of regulatory experts who are going to share some of the current thinking that we have within the FDA. And um, as Steve said, I'm not going to go into too much as far as the introductions for the speakers, but here's the outline of the presentations. So we're going to start with um, Lawrence Coyne, then transition to Dr. Harner, Commander Janda, Lisa Kennard, Alex Balin, and finally from uh, Ian Broberman. All of them have different expertises and different considerations that they're gonna bring to um, share with us today. And I think with that, I will turn it over to 
Dr. Coyne. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Beams. Uh, so I, I'm Dr. Larry Coyne. I'm director of the Division of Restorative Repair and Trauma Devices in the Office of Orthopedic Devices in uh, <clears throat> within uh, FDA's uh, CDR, um, within the CRH's uh, uh, Office of Product Evaluation and Quality. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, FDA's uh, mission is uh, defined as it's to, uh, CDRH's uh, mission is to protect and promote the public health, uh, assure that patients and providers have timely and continued access to safe, effective, and high quality medical devices and safe radiation emitting products and then also to facilitate medical device innovation by advancing regulatory science, providing industry with predictable, consistent, transparent, and efficient regulatory pathways. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> uh, FDA's uh, vision, or CDRH's uh, vi vision statement rather is, Patients in the U.S. have access to high-quality, safe, and effective medical devices of public health importance, first in the world. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Providing the, the framework for the presentations to follow, uh, medical extended reality encompasses the spectrum of technologies that display virtual objects uh, in the real environment, uh, namely augmented reality, or present a fully virtual wor world or virtual reality. Found within this continuous spectrum is mixed reality, which incorporates elements of both augmented and virtual reality. Uh, virtual and augmented realities are defined in detail in the next slide. Uh, provide, um, uh, virtual reality is specifically de defined as a completely artificial environment accepted as real by users. Uh, augmented reality is an integrated technique of image processing uh, with an AR system, real objects and virtual computer computer generated objects are combined in a real environment. Uh, furthermore, real and virtual objects are aligned with each other and run interactively in real time. Next slide, please. With respect to extended reality guides, uh, these devices provide visual guidance during surgical procedures where the use of stereotactic navigation is utilized. Uh, visual guidance is displayed as extended reality stereoscopic images which augment the user's field of view and or may appear to be directly overlaying the patient's anatomy relative to a rigid patient reference. This device is intended to be used interoperatively in conjunction with a stereotactic navigation system as an adjunct means to display patient anatomy in surgical information. The device is not intended to be used for diagnostic purposes does not include virtual reality, video see-through, pass-through, or holograms. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Christopher Harner will present on extended reality in orthopedics, surgical perspectives, and critical questions. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Dr. Klein, for that introduction. Uh, I am an orthopedic surgeon who spent the majority of my career at the University of Pittsburgh prior to coming to the FDA three years ago. My official title is Clinical Deputy Office Director, Office of Orthopedic Devices, which is also referred to as OHT6. Today, I will be speaking to you about extended reality in orthopedics, but specifically about the surgical perspectives 
and critical questions. Much of what I have to say today is relevant to the other speakers. So next slide, please. This is my outline. I uh, will present current, uh, uh, current status of extended reality in orthopedics. I will uh, cover surgical perspectives and this relatively new technology. And I will uh, present critical questions that are relevant to healthcare providers and patients. And finally finish with a few uh, con uh, future considerations. Next slide, please. Extended reality in orthopedics, Dr. Coyne just, uh, defined what virtual reality and augmented reality. I wanted to cover what how those are uh, in, in, in orthopedics. Virtual reality is currently not used in surgical practice. Its main orthopedic use is in training and education for residents, fellows, practicing orthopedists, and other allied health professionals. Augmented reality is currently in use for surgical procedures. Its impact on our field has been significant and is reflected in publication, numerous publications in the literatures. But most of these publications are small clinical trials, less than 50 patients, mostly outside the US. The data collected is on device usage, techniques, and accuracy with limited patient clinical data. And finally, complications reported are rare, with the most common published being increased surgical time. Uh, there is a common theme that I will present here during my talk on complications. Next slide, please. OHT6, our Office of Orthopedic Devices, has cleared 29 augmented reality submissions in the last five years. You can see this graph from 2019 to 24 with a significant number of uh, submissions uh, increasing every year. Next slide, please. The current applications uh, in orthopedics in six different subspecialties, there's nine subspecialties in orthopedics, six are currently using augmented reality. That's in spine, hip, knee, shoulder, trauma, and oncology. And you can see the applications uh, just to the right of the subspecialty. Next slide, please. I will now cover surgical perspectives in augmented reality. Next slide, please. This is a very important slide that depicts the surgical workflow starting with preoperative planning to surgical intervention. The process starts with uploading patient imaging scans in the user interface. Using the manufacturer's software application, the images are then segmented to develop an initial three-dimensional model of patient anatomy. Preoperatively, the software allows the surgeon to plan where they would like to guide instruments or place implants. Once the realistic model is uploaded, the surgeon user can view augmented reality images, which can be projected as fixed images or overlaid directly on the surgeon's field of view. In the operating room, shown in the lower left-hand corner, the uh, In the operating room shown in the lower left-hand corner, the patient and instrument tracking information are coordinated with the augmented reality display to allow surgeons to closely align virtual patient anatomy to in relation to the patient actual anatomy. And very importantly, as each of these steps are tied to patient safety, they should be implemented with the highest precision of accuracy. Next slide, please. With any medical device, the FDA has to carefully analyze the benefits and risks associated with medical devices. This slide demonstrates benefits on the right and risk on the left. On the left, uh, this is not all inclusive and does vary depending on the device. But this is the, the these are the uh, most common benefits risks that we cite in terms of benefits: minimally invasive surgery. Uh, it improves ergonomics. Implement multiple surgical steps via one device. It provides three-dimensional model of patient anatomy and theoretically can better visualize uh, visualization of complex anatomy. In terms of the risk, there can be loss of depth perception. The image overlay can directly interfere with the surgeon's view of the field, which can be problematic. There is reduction in image contrast and image washout, it can be. 
uh, limited peripheral vision, motion sickness, and there is a significant learning curve that the uh, surgical team uh, has to go through to use these devices. Next slide, please. I think it's very important to realize that each platform is unique and has unique technological differences. For example, headset design may vary. Each system has its own proprietary software. Surgical workflow varies between systems and procedures. The three-dimensional projected display means may vary depending on the, the, the setup. And finally, user training and learning curve may vary between systems. Very importantly, currently a standard te test method does not exist for validating user experience across multiple surgical platforms. Next slide, please. I will finish my talk with critical questions to consider for uh, the patients and end users, which is the surgeon and the surgical team. These questions that uh, these are the questions that should be considered prior to the informed consent and preparation for surgery. These questions were developed at, by the FDA following a public webinar on AR VR medical devices in 2022 and was recently published in September 1st of 2023 and is publicly available. Next slide, please. These are the seven critical questions specifically developed for healthcare providers to ask before deciding to adopt AR technologies in their surgical practices. Uh, please listen to these questions. They're very important. These are the ones considered to be very important to the patients and the providers, as I mentioned. One, is there clinical evidence for using extended reality in healthcare? Are there benefits to using extended reality? Are there limitations to who can use extended reality? What training and education are needed to safely and effectively use extended reality? How will extended reality change a procedure or workflow? How do I transition to alternative treatment techniques when needed? And finally, does extended reality pose any physical risk to healthcare professionals? Next slide. In conclusion, augmented reality technology in orthopedics is new and evolving. Training and education for surgeons and the surgical team are important to ensure to ensuring these devices are being used safely and effectively. And finally, FDA infographics for patients that I presented and for healthcare professionals have been developed to help with informed decisions before using augmented or virtual reality medical devices. Thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to our discussion and the rest of the panel. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Michael Janda, Commander Janda. Thank you, Dr. Harner. Uh, good morning, everyone. My presentation is intended to describe some of the technical challenges experienced by the Office of Orthopedic Devices when reviewing orthopedic extended reality technology. Next slide, please. The current regulatory pathway for orthopedic AR devices has utilized an existing regulatory classification when determined substantially equivalent. Specifically, the stereotactic device regulation 882 that is defined as devices with rigid structures that are calibrated to guide instruments relative to patient anatomy. Within this regulation exists a product code, OLO, that establishes an orthopedic stereotactic, stereotactic device type. Next slide, please. That was the regulatory device definition. This slide presents the current practical application of AR technology in this device area and emphasizes how the stereotactics technology serves as the primary basis for supporting other advanced technologies. First, a stereotactic system can use various navigation technologies, including physical, optical, or inertial patient and image tracking as illustrated in the top image. These systems share the common characteristics of, care of continuously tracking rigid anatomy via physically mounted patient trackers. AR technology can act as an accessory technology to stereotactic systems. Arguably, the simplest example is a stereotactic system that features a head-mounted display to replicate the exact same information as would be traditionally shown to the user via a 2D monitor with no HMD control interface. 
Additional extended reality applications make use of the stereotactic navigation system's ability to track the location of rigid structures with accuracy established as acceptable for orthopedic applications. Next slide, please. While the agency has found acceptable applications of these new technologies in the orthopedic stereotactic regulation, there are some technical characteristics that are currently considered outside of this regulation. For example, non-rigid patient tracking, lack of continuous patient tracking, completely immersive virtual reality, excessive obstruction of the user's field of view, and performance below medical requirements are not considered appropriate. In addition, there are other regulations and, re and regulated product types that may be more applicable to a particular device. Next slide, please. The next few slides present some technical challenges that OHT6 has identified in reviewing AR technology. The first step in assessing this technology is to characterize its performance. OHT6, in conjunction with our colleagues in OCEL, has developed a list of performance testing considerations, such as luminance, contrast, et cetera. These tests focus upon demonstrating the general performance of the projection technology and user experience. Beyond this technical characterization testing, OHT6 also asked that medical AR developers assess system accuracy using traditional stereotactic accuracy testing as applicable. For systems intended only as a heads-up display, that meaning the AR serves as a secondary information projection source only to the traditional primary 2D monitor, this testing is the same validation as requested for the stereotactic system itself, as the AR system cannot impact upon the displayed information. However, when intended to provide additional 3D projection or models corresponding to the navigation data provided by the primary stereotactic system, medical AR developers are asked to provide additional quantitative validation of the projected model's spatial accuracy under simulated worst case conditions. Developing a validation protocol for 3D projections and models is challenging as these virtual models are intended to be observed and interpreted from the user's perspective. They are also potentially subject to environmental factors such as HMD motion and background conditions. Therefore, an objective validation requires observation from an independent exterior method that has the same perspective as the user and includes anticipated environmental conditions. We highly recommend that you consider utilizing the pre-submission program to obtain FDA feedback to your performance testing protocols and methods. Next slide, please. Some of the additional challenges that the agency is observing include user interaction issues with various control mechanisms that may be novel to surgeon users. For example, systems that utilize a commercial off-the-shelf HFD with vocal and hand gestures as a control interface may cause user difficulties when used in a medical environment. This difficulty can be attributed to both the novelty of the user interface, but also the medical environment sounds, moving objects, and reflective services, surfaces. OHC6 is also interested in assessing the potential of this technology to cause negative effects on the surgeons in the form of eye strain, neck strain, or increased surgical time. Further, there is a potential for sterility compromise if the H HMD is inadvertently interacted with. These issues may not be immediately evident in the performance testing uh, that we see in your submission and may be user dependent. In general, novel technologies are known to be associated with training and learning curve challenges. OHT expects that this will apply to AR technology and seeks mitigation strategies to minimize user and patient risks. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, sorry, I got confused on the slides. The slide, this slide discussed some of the additional higher level testing that may be useful to validate these systems. Typically for stereotactic systems, quantitative system level validation testing is conducted that compares the accuracy between planned implant placement and the final implant placement in a cadaveric model. This has also been the case for AR systems. Additionally, human factors usability testing has been deemed applicable to these systems. The design of such human factors studies 
has taken into consideration the intended adjunctive versus integral use of the system, as well as the ability to discontinue use in a convenient way. Video or step-by-step -step illustrations of the projected imagery is also very helpful to understand what is intended to be seen by the user. Clinical data or redefinition of clinically meaningful endpoints may also be warranted depending upon specific technical characteristics and medical application. It is important to note that AR technology performance expectations can differ between medical procedures and clinical specialties. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will hand the presentation over to Dr. Lisa Kennard. Hi, my name is Lisa Kennard, and um, I will speak with you today about um, AR, VR review um, within the radiological field. Next slide, please. So as far as, the, as far as the applications um, in radiology, uh, what we tend to see is there's, there's education. So as you see on the left, we have students that are in med school. Now notice that um, these, these devices are exempt for classroom. You don't have to go through a 510K for classroom education, but if you go into an intra-procedural arena, then that changes things. You'll have to do a 510K for that. Uh, another application would be remote collaboration. So on the right, we have uh, you know, where MetaView and GE um, join forces to develop this system where they can be um, in different corners of the world and speak about a, a case collaboratively. Next slide, please. What we see just about every day um, in OHT8 is uh, for surgical planning. So here's a uh, so here's a clear device here which has uh, you know some segmentation results in these three quadrants with the uh, resulting kind of VR uh, representation in the lower right corner. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a, I'd like to uh, make a um, differentiation between uh, software verification and there's feature validation. Those are two very different things. So software verification is simply that where if you if you were to uh, annotate um, a and a piece of the anatomy, for example, and you click a button and a cursor appears and you can type and everything works correctly. That is what we call software verification. So that would be a pass. Feature validation, on the other hand, it tests the features to see if they're close to the way you would do things traditionally. So if we had a box in AR space and we, and we measured that box, we want to make sure that it's close to a measurement uh, using traditional methods. So that would be the difference. Uh, next slide, please. So as far as our performance data for preoperative surgical planning, if you were doing, um, if you have a device that is visualization only, you are just putting a headset on and looking at um, a piece of an anatomy and maybe rotating it with your hand, uh, what we would expect is that you would state what you're visualizing, um, go through software testing, there would be some image quality testing, uh, there's visual as well as benchtop testing. And, um, and your testing should occur for a specific headset. So if you're using a Microsoft HoloLens, we want to see testing for that headset. Um, so in the lower right here is just an example of one of the types of, of visual testing that would be uh, re required during your review. Now, if there's visualization plus other functions, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, uh, you would have to do everything on the left side, as well as there would be some usability testing. So we want to know, you know, will the user make as accurate a measurement using a head mounted display as that person would on a desktop? Um, the validation of other functions would be things such as image segmentation or measurements, which we see quite a bit in the orthopedic space. Uh, we would need to make sure that those uh, match up fairly well. Next slide, please. Now, when we move into the intraoperative space, um, um, things will change quite a bit. So, uh, so what would be you would need to do all of the all of the things that I've mentioned on the previous slide. But if you are superimposing a field of view on a patient, we would strongly encourage um, a pre-submission, which, um, um, which Michael just explained, where you would come in and we would have a meeting and discuss your device um, in specific detail. Because registration accuracy evaluation and acceptable performance are very, very tied to what you're, you are doing clinically. So that is very, very important. Um, so far, we've cleared limited devices for, for heads-up display, for, for visualization, but we have not moved into the intraoperative space as far as clearance is concerned yet. Um, we would also need detailed information regarding um, the use case. And, and this is important because sometimes the cases will move 
into uh, if you can do something slightly different and it will move you into the surgical space or in the orthopedic space. And we want to make sure that we're reviewing in the right regulation. Uh, next slide, please. So for um, for Q submission or pre-submission meetings that, that um, um, we've just spoken about for both pre-operative and intra-operative, um, what, you, what you need to bring to this meeting is um, very important device description. Uh, talk about the intended patient population, uh, what predicate device you plan to use, um, a use case. Uh, if you are using an AL, AIML algorithm, we, we need to have some information about the training and test sets, training and testing test sets. And, um, and so the usability, as you move from the preoperative to the intraoperative space, it, it ramps up quite a bit. So, so bear that in mind. Um, some common questions that come up um, for us most often are uh, study design, definitely. Uh, most people ask about their study design. Now, we can comment on the design itself, but not the results. That was That's something that would take place during formal review. Um, another, another other questions that come up are about the composition of the test set. So your test set needs to show that it's generalizable to other populations, other imaging acquisition um, parameters, other image acquisition devices, and things of that nature. Um, we prefer to have 50% of the um, images acquired in the U.S. That is not a hard and fast rule, but that is that's a preference on our part. Um, if you have, if none of your images have been acquired in the U.S., we would need to know and we need an appropriate justification for why you would be using all images outside of the U.S. Um, there, and another thing that comes up often is people want to know, um, well, well, how many images do I need? There's, there's really no set number. We just need to see that there's the expected that they will, the numbers will reflect the expected variability within the proposed population. Next slide, please. So this is um, the XR90. This is a, a device that's been cleared in the in the last year. Um, this is certainly the most complex device that we've worked on. So what you what you're seeing here is um, the surgeon with the, with the head mounted display. The uh, one surgeon has a probe in his hand. He is using it in what's called flashlight mode. So flashlight meaning you can see down inside the person, but he can see it right in front of his face, right and um, and so the 3D image um, rendering down inside the patient is an image that was required or acquired on an earlier um, acquisition session. And so all of those things are registered and, and lined up as they start. Um, next slide, please. So this, this device is unique um, because it uses a live ultrasound image uh, uh, imaging. It has been cleared as a preoperative um, heads up device, but not in the intraoperative space yet. Um, they um, they definitely uh, had to do quite a bit of testing. So there was, there was a lot of bench testing is with latency and accuracy and things of that nature. Um, they, had, they had some electrical safety testing because they had a few devices that were their own in-house development. So, um, and there was system cleaning and disinfection because while this is not an intraoperative device, it is used in the intraoperative space. That's why they had to go through the disinfection um, kind of testing. Next slide, please. So, so in conclusion, validation is a key component of, of performance testing. Very, very important. Um, the intraoperative use um, significantly increases the testing expectations. And for either preoperative or intraoperative, pre-submissions are always highly, highly encouraged. Thank you for your time. And next, we will have Dr. Balin, who will speak about um, AR, VR, and ophthalmology. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kinnard. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alex Balin. I'm senior lead reviewer in the retinal and diagnostic device team in the division of ophthalmic devices. Today, I will discuss the use of virtual reality augmented reality technology in use in ophthalmology and some relevant considerations regarding the design of the devices with that type of technology. Next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, the uh, term medical devices are defined in section 201H of the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. Broadly, there are two major categories of medical devices, diagnostic and therapeutic devices. Examples of diagnostic devices include tonometers, fundus cameras, and optical coherence tomography devices. Examples of therapeutic devices include spectacle lenses, intraocular lenses, and ophthalmic lasers. Next slide, please. 
Most of the ophthalmic devices are regulated under Section 21 of Code of Federal Regulation, Part 886. However, some of ophthalmic devices are regulated on different part of CFR, like neurology, radiology, etc. Most devices are low or moderate risk devices and regulated as class one or class two. However, there are some high risk devices such as in intraocular lenses or refractive lasers. These devices are regulated as class three. Most of ophthalmic devices are prescription devices indicated for professional use. However, there are some prescription devices available that are indicated for lay users, such as home use thermometers or contact lenses. Some ophthalmic devices are also available as over-the-counter, for example, reading glasses and digital visual activity charts. Next slide, please. All medical devices, including uh, those with AR, VR technology, are grouped into two major categories. Diagnostic devices, which are indicated for diagnosis of diseases or conditions or treatment devices, which are indicated for cure, mitigation or prevention of these diseases or conditions. Depend on the indication, the users of such devices may be healthcare providers or patients. The devices with VR technology may facilitate treatment, diagnosis, improves usability, helps with the visualization and clinical decision-making process. The VR-based devices that do not meet definition of the medical devices are not regulated by FDA. Examples of such VR devices include training systems for the doctors, simulators of surgical outcome for the patients, devices for assessment of the patient performance, and so on. Next slide, please. One clinical application of AR-VR technology is therapeutics. Examples include amblyopia treatment devices, binocular vision uh, dysfunction, low vision assistance, myopia control. These examples may utilize different presentation algorithm, varying contrast, luminance, magnifying images, and so on. Next slide, please. Another application of AR, VR technology is diagnostics. Example include nystagmographs, perimeters, and visual field analyzers. In these devices, the information is presented to the patients through the head-mounted display, and the diagnostic output is generated based on the analysis of the eye movement or patient response data. While not currently authorized by FDA, there are other devices with AR-VR technology on the horizon for screening or monitoring of the of ophthalmic diseases and conditions. Next slide, please. Another use of AR VR devices are devices assisting physicians where they may improve visualization of surgical field, highlight area of clinical concern, show status of the instrument, and so forth. This may help to make surgical intervention more efficient and safe. One of such devices, clear devices by FDA, is an intraoperative optical coherence tomography integrated with surgical microscope. These devices overlays the virtual image of the tissue section with realistic optical imaging of the operating field. This modality helps surgeon to perform the procedure faster than its uh, information is presented in a separate uh, visualization channel. Next slide, please. There are AR, VR applications which we do not consider as a medical devices. As an example, there are AR VR devices used for education, development specific sets of skills, and to make training process more interactive and efficient. For example, a person can stand in a virtual reality eyeball and look around inside the eye. A 2017 study published in Journal of Ophthalmology found the surgical skills of the cataract surgeons are significantly improved after training in virtual reality simulators. Some virtual reality training devices, such as IC, are even implemented within many residency programs. Another example of non-medical device are visual simulators, where the patients can use the VR-based devices to simulate possible surgical outcomes and make more informed decisions regarding the upcoming procedure. There are also VR devices that use clinical information, such as eye movement, to assess general health and conditions and skills, for example, reading and sports. Such devices may be considered general wellness devices and would not be included in FDA regulatory oversight. Next slide, please. ARVR has also been studied to assess patient performance outcome. 
in the field of uh, in the field of ophthalmic medical products, often there are limitations to assess how well the drugs, biologics, or device are working within conventional vision assessment uh, methods such as visual acuity chart or imaging, especially in pa uh, patients with profound vision loss. AR VR can be utilized to study functional vision performance for patients, especially as it relates to activity of daily living. One of the examples is a mobility standardized test, MOST in virtual reality, presenting behavioral endpoints to assess the performance of patients with inherited retinal diseases in daily life. <clears throat> Those the standardization of test conditions, such as light condition, contrast sensitivity, control of loading effect, and so on. And conducting multiple performance measurements, such as results of this mobility test may be used to assess the disease progression and effects of the treatment. Even though this test may not be considered as a medical device, FDA may still review it because it leverages to support medical product performance, for example, the other drugs, biologics, or devices. The design of the medical devices that use AR, VR technology and ophthalmology should consider the risk. Here is the example of some considerations. There are system design considerations, which may include overall uh, hardware design, thank you, overall hardware design, for example, optical see-through head-mounted display design versus all virtual HMD design, use of additional built-in HMD technology, for example, eye tracker video camera, usability, optical considerations, geometrical dist uh, distortion and chromatic aberration of uh, headset optics are important for adequate presentation of the visual context. Matching interpupillary inter distance for the IPD uh, of the intended population, for example, kids, are important for safe and effective use of the devices. Intraocular geometrical differences and misalignment, such as rotation and vertical misalignment, can lead to visual discomfort, discomfort and binocular fusion for the user. Display considerations, which may include image resolution consideration, luminance, uniformity, contrast of the display, those are important for image quality or virtual content. Frame rate, it's an application, the frame rate are part of the therapeutic or the, of the algorithm. <clears throat> so it's important that the HMD, the device or the, or the selected device supports the frame rate that is necessary. Please note that due to the multiple specific requirements, the majority of uh, head-mounted uh, displays used in ophthalmology are device specific. Therefore, device should be validated with the specific compatible model of HMD. Next slide, please. Diagnostic devices that use AR VR technology present additional challenges to the developers. These challenges may include hardware requirements specific for the device diagnostic functions. If the device performs measurements, agreement or accuracy of the measurement should be demonstrated. For these devices, precision, which may include repeatability and reproducibility, are necessary to study variability of the measurement. Studies should be conducted in the intended patient population as well. Next slide, please. Therapeutic specific consideration may include clinical validation. The clinical trial should be carefully designed to validate safety and effectiveness and points. The safety endpoints may include adverse events, worsening conditions, etc. Effectiveness endpoints may include assessment of the therapeutic effect and sustainability of the, of the therapeutic effect. There may be hardware requirements specific, specific for the device therapeutic functions. Usability. Can the device be successfully used by intended population? Especially it's important for the home user devices what the device is indicated for the lay, by the lay user. Some design considerations are linked to the specific risk to the patients. The risk can be mitigated through the compliance with the specific performance standards or special controls. For example, under uh, 21 CFR 886-5500, we establish special controls for digital therapy devices indicated for treatment of amblyopia. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the same sentiment I repeat over as the previous speakers. If you plan to develop VR-based device for use in, in ophthalmology, we strongly recommend that you submit a pre-submission to FDA. 
requesting FD feedback on any requirements in design prior to conducting validation of your device, bench validation and or clinical validation may save your time and resources and ultimately help to bring your device to the market faster. Uh, so as a summary, as a take-home message, virtual augmented reality devices used in ophthalmology can be diagnostic and therapeutic and are mostly class one or class two. FD regulates medical devices, but may assess non-device performance and applications if used to support a medical device product. There are general and specific considerations applicable to the design and validation of ophthalmic uh, AR, VR devices. There are performance standards and special controls applicable to some of the devices by, uh, using VR technology. Medical devices that use AR, VR technology are usually not HMD agnostic. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Oh, hi, everybody. I'm Ian Braverman. I am in the Office of Neurological and Physical Medicine Devices. Uh, I know we've just given you a lot of information. It's a lot to process. It's it's also a lot for us to process. Uh, I thought to to help illustrate how we use the the uh, this information, all the information you've heard today, uh, I take you through one of the regulatory decisions we made recently over here in, in neurosurgery, uh, which is as uh, you know. Uh, Commander Janda was talking about, you know, the stereotactic systems. Uh, we, we determined that for neurosurgery that we would consider an AR device that's performing a similar function to be a different regulatory class. That would be that, you know, our, our regulatory classes are, are a, a broad definition in the, that's actually codified in the law as to what that device is. And we, we feel that an augmented reality device that, that does a similar function uh, should have a, a different framework, a regulatory framework in the law. And uh, I want to take you through how we came to that decision. And of course, with any device, we're, we're looking at, you know, the, the safety and efficacy of it. Uh, we make the way we determine safety and efficacy, as Dr. Harner had mentioned, is we're looking at the risks and the benefits, uh, specifically in this case, what we're looking at is the, the new risks of this type of system. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so in a traditional uh, stereotactic system, uh, it's really you have a fixed camera looking at a patient. Uh, the, the, the big, like one of the biggest drivers, certainly not the only driver of an AR system is you, you now have that camera mounted on the, uh, the surgeon and they're looking through it. Uh, considerations that were, we made to determine that this should be a different type of device, we looked at what's the current technological considerations. That's what are we seeing right now? What's coming in the door right now? What are people like proposing to us? Uh, we tried to take a, a step back, a big picture approach to what are the fundamental uh, traits of these systems. We want to, whenever we create a new regulation for a new type of device, we want it to be as broad as possible so we don't have to keep making them every other week. We want to make it broad so we can fit a lot of, you know, a lot of different types of devices under one umbrella. It makes it easier for you to come in to us knowing what to send us under that umbrella. And also, you know, what are the potential applications? So we, uh, you know, where can this be used? Where is it going to be used? Uh, give an example of that. Next slide, please. So when you come into the FDA with uh, any type of application, we're going to request an indication for use. Uh, the indication for use statement, it's a, it's a statement that uh, is a series of definitions for, for what your treatment is going to be. And the indication for use defines the disease or condition that will be diagnosed, treated, prevented, cured, mitigated, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's basically the, the opening statement and definition of you know, what you're presenting to us in this submission. And after I did my first run through of my presentation here, I realized this is probably the worst slide to lead off with on this presentation because uh, this is only going, you know, this specifically goes into our current technological considerations. 
uh, it doesn't go into the other two of you know, projecting where this might be in the future. However, I didn't move it in my presentation because I wanted to tell you, the audience, this is where our FDA's head is at. When we see that indication for use on your submission that you're sending to us, this is what we're looking for. If you are indicating for the use for, you know, an application to go into, say, put in deep brain stimulation leads, and you also have an application there that does something like for dental work, we're going to ask you to remove it. We're only going to review what's in the indications. Uh, we can't review things that aren't covered in the definition. That that is defining what we you know what we're looking for to make sure it's okay to go in the market under these indications so, so that said what we're seeing right now uh with what's coming in with ar systems is there a lot of people especially in ortho it's very close to what we're seeing uh coming in with very lightweight solutions uh you know a a full camera system a fixed camera system on the floor usually also comes with a cranial fixation system where the head is fixated and it has navigated instrument guides which attach directly to the patient so that you can very slowly and precisely uh, move a channel to get an instrument directly into the patient's cranium uh, on uh, with very tight tolerances. Uh, usually these, these surgeries in neuro are, are all down one trajectory. So you, the, the trick is you wanna get that trajectory as tight as possible. Uh, with augmented reality systems, because they are coming in, uh, they're looking for a different use. We're look, you know, we are looking for, we both are looking for a niche where these are going to add a, a, new, um, use, a new use to the, you know, to, to uh, surgery. Uh, and the uses that we're seeing are for lightweight areas where it's going to be more mobile, uh, has a lower profile, can be used outside the, the OR, uh, and, and has other features that just aren't available on a traditional stereotactic system. Uh, and that's what we're seeing right now. That could change in the future. Uh, we, we are also, as you know, talking about you know, the yellow box down there, uh, you know, we're, we're comparing you know, the benefits of those risks as well. We realize that, you know, by having, not having a fixated head and not having those guides, you're not gonna be able to get as good of an accuracy if you're you know, moving your hand to, to move the instrument to the head as opposed to carefully setting up a jig to move the, the device into the patient. Uh, but you know, we, we look at the benefits of what's, what, you know, what are you adding to the equation versus you know, what are you not doing uh, you know, what, what are you losing? You wouldn't want to, you wouldn't go, want to go in by hand to put in deep brain stimulation leads because you might be going in like eight or nine centimeters into the head. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is the official slide that I should have started with. Uh, the big, one of the big uh, differences is how you are presenting this information uh, to the surgeon. Uh, it is in front of, there, you know, there, there is up close and personal in a stereographic view. I will mention, as I think uh, Dr. Hunter, I think mentioned it earlier, it is not a hologram. Please don't call it a hologram. You know, as I said, our regulations are in law. Uh, the the tech, the the type of science used to project these are not holograms, and we, you know, if you call it that, that is not, that would be considered mislabeling. Uh, it can provide a heads-up display that's closer to the patient, which is essentially just, you know, one type of display. It's just a floating monitor in front of the patient, like over their head, attached to the patient to keep the surgeon from having to turn their neck. Surgeons like not having to do that. Uh, there's also a possibility with this technology of projecting directly onto the patient or like something between the surgeon and the patient. Uh, these have these do present different levels of risk, and this is our considerations. Uh, one of the considerations we make is for a heads-up display near the patient, it, it's probably not going to add a lot more risk than a traditional uh, monitor. It does have that benefit of you know less neck strain. Uh, if you're only looking at going into the patient head-on, as opposed to you see on the left there, 
that you have an orthogonal view. It, it may be easier to judge in an orthogonal view if you're going straight into the patient, uh, how close, you know, you know, you know, if you're going into a tumor, when you're coming to the end of the tumor as part of going through it. So that it could be harder to judge depth in, 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 a, uh, in, a, in a heads up VR view. Uh, the biggest challenge is one of the biggest things that we see as a new type of science is the benefits and risks of having something projected between the, the surgeon and the patient. Uh, while you can provide guidance in a, in a way that you couldn't before, you can also block the view of critical anatomy, which can be changing behind your view uh, as it's being displayed and the surgeon may not know. Uh, the way it's displayed also, if you have a, a, a uh, virtual uh, instrument displayed on top of your real instrument, or if you have differences in, in lighting and contrast, it can be very disorienting wearing these. You know, surgeons can lose track of, am I looking at my device or am I looking at the cartoon of the device that's supposed to be guiding me? Uh, you know, these are all like the risk considerations. This is a new type of risk, uh, not available on the traditional uh, stereotactic systems, which is why we're, we're looking at a, a new type of device. Next slide, please. Uh, another uh, factor to consider is the camera is positioned on your head. Uh, it's a different workflow in a fixed camera system. The patient is set up preoperatively exactly to be where you want the patient. Everything's going to be in view. Uh, then the, the procedure starts and, you know, the, the patient has to, to be able to track the patient, you, you're going to have reference points on the patient. Sometimes there's something called fiducial markers. Sometimes the surgeon is just aligning uh, points on the patient with the points that are in the imaging uh, from anatomical landmarks, but it's all in view. If they somehow go out of view, usually the surgery is stopped and they readjust and start again. AR systems is different. The camera is always moving. It's moving with the user's head. Uh, those reference points may be going in and out of frame. That is a new type of risk. You know, there is a possibility that if you don't have enough, uh, if you if you don't have enough of those reference points, it's like if you're driving with GPS and you go into a tunnel, suddenly your reference system is not responding because you don't see it anymore. Or it doesn't see you. Uh, you. There's different considerations to make for that. Uh, the surgeon should know that if tracking is lost, and also uh, they should know in a way that is not disruptive to them, does not cover the patient again, but also uh, uh, does not like interfere with if they're trying to do something else with the headset on. Uh, next slide, please. Latency. Uh, this is not a different type of risk from augmented reality systems versus the traditional stereotactic systems with a fixed camera. Uh, it is, there could be a heightened level of the same risk, but it is a known risk. It's a heightened level of the same risk because uh, there is much more computationally going on. When you know you have a fixed camera, it's only tracking the. Uh, you know, I have a tracker here, something like this. I can see that. Uh, it, that's what the camera is focusing on. It's just tracking that point. With with a, a moving camera, everything is moving. It's more computational power. It could slow things down significantly. It could, especially if you're using a, a third-party headset uh, like a Hololens or all the, you know, a, a Magic Leap or all those other things that uh, their software might be overloaded. Uh, even though they may give specs that they can handle a certain amount of latency, putting your software on top of it can dramatically slow things down. So latency is a is a Something that you know, it's it's still a it's a concern in all systems, but it's it's very much you know a big concern for AR systems. Next slide. And speaking of those third-party systems, that is something that's uh, a difference with working with these uh, systems. Uh, when we're working with a a traditional stereotactic navigation system with a fixed camera, it's usually a company that is putting things together themselves, soup to nuts. They, they buy some off the shelf components and link them together, but generally they, they are the, the masters of destiny there. 
uh, they know what's going on with uh, with all the components they're coming in and using. Uh, some of these uh, third-party uh, head-mounted displays, such as like the HoloLens or you know the Google Glass, all those, you may not be familiar with what's going on behind the scenes. We we sometimes we'll have to ask you what's going on behind the scenes, and you may not. You know, we have to determine an answer to to make sure it's meeting like any safety requirements. Like you know, if if for example they they haven't reported what the materials are, we do have to make sure it's biocompatible. Uh, we have reached out to manufacturers uh, of those and told them about a, a program. I don't know if any manufacturers are online that they could also submit a, what's called a master file to us that they can tell us you know their trade secrets without sharing it to the world so that we can just check things off our list but you know there's no we we don't have all that information we just it's just something to be conscious of uh finally I'm, let me get to the next slide finally i'm wrapping it up uh there are the unknown unknowns i mean this is still a rapidly changing field you guys are great innovators we're we're waiting to see what you bring in next. And as every other speaker has said, we really encourage pre-submissions, otherwise known as Q-submissions. I don't know if they've mentioned it before, they're free. This is a free consultation on how to get through our regula regulation and what you may need to know on, uh, in terms of the technology on what to present to us. I just put a link in the chat uh, for DICE. We have a service that will give you general information on how to go through like the, 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 the regulatory processes. But when you get into the technology, come to the, the divisions that are actually dealing with the uh, indications you're looking for. Uh, some advice for, for when you're, you're presenting to us, if you're presenting a new device, uh, aside from the pre-submissions, start small. It's much easier, you know, get one or two things we, we may have to ask for studies, including it may take clinical studies, depending on what you're asking for. Uh, it's easier to do one study, manage it, you know, get something on the market. And then you can always come back later with more submissions. That's what everybody does. A da Vinci robot came in with like dozens of submissions to get to the level of uh, usability they have. Uh, and uh, yeah, just be, be aware that each new indication that you add can also require new testing as well. And uh, that's it for me. I thank you all. I thank all the speakers. Uh, thank you for our host. We're really happy to be here. All right, thank you, Ian, and thank you, everyone. Um, I really appreciate the, all the helpful information. I see we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions. We'll end at 10 after. Um, like Steve said. Uh, so the first question is, can you talk more about the form to submit and how we're using XR tools? Um, and, sorry, and can you talk more about the form to submit and how we are using XR tools are being used in clinics? I think this was probably from the timestamp, I would say probably this was specifically for one of the OHT six, one of the orthopedic um, presentations, but I don't know if anyone has any comments on to respond to that one. Uh, I think uh, I'm not quite sure which forms they're they're referring to. I okay, it, it was answered. Oh, okay, okay, great. Um, and then there was also a question about new methods um, like using other inputs. Um, other other inputs such as so I would assume I think we may be getting more information um, okay yeah I would assume that this one is kind of talking about like if you have okay instead of hand so if you want to use other types like say voice tracking eye tracking things like that um, you know what what might be some of the considerations for that I mean I can mention one that we've definitely heard is for instance like with the um, voice commands depending on if you have a mask or don't have a mask accent the noise in the or all of these type of things can 
play a role in how well the like voice commands tend to work. But mm -hmm. I don't know if others have um, comments about different types of input into yeah. the device of the user interface. Yeah, I mean, you have to take into consideration when you're designing the device. Uh, there's going to be there's going to be a human factors usability. Uh, if the surgeon is if they has to use hand gestures for something, but they're doing surgery, uh, that that that's going to be problematic. Uh, also, if you have a lot of very specific operations that that your device is going to do, uh, there there is a there's a degradation of training. If you, if you have to memorize an entire dictionary of terms to activate your system, uh, you can run into difficulties with voice commands. You know, having some sort of menu option. Uh, it's going to be different situation by situation, but it, you know, it's, and definitely something that we can talk about in a pre-submission. Uh, but you know, the, the choice between, you know, hand commands, voice commands, having a separate monitor with an, an aid working with you, uh, just trying to find what makes sense and what works best for the procedure. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Um, yeah, the next question is, will there be a different webinar regarding the XR rehabilitation usage? What are the key insights the FDA regarding rehabilitation for XR tech? So I don't know if Alex potentially you have any thoughts on that since there's some overlap with rehabilitation for ophthalmolic. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, the question is, well, so first of all, I can address that was, will there be a different webinar for rehabilitation usage? I think that's an important application area and we can definitely look at trying to organize something similar to address those. And then there was a, the second part of the question is key insights regarding rehabilitation usage for XR. So I don't know if you could speak a little bit to um, some of the ophthalmolic type applications or maybe Ian has some thoughts on the some of the neuro applications. Um, yeah, go, go ahead. I, I think, yeah, for, for, uh, we, there are, our, our neuro division also looks at, uh, psychological and PTSD. There's a lot of, uh, applications for reducing anxiety, creating environments. Uh, you know, one, one consideration to do is, is, uh, as it was brought up at, uh, our, our previous conference is to identify, uh, what you're displaying and, you know, not just that you're using a tool if you're doing a study like show like represent to us what is being used for the patient what they're seeing uh what your visual content is for that type of thing uh other other considerations is how are you going to validate uh your system uh different psychological functions often have uh different validated scales some of them are like leaker tests for patient reported or, or physician reported results uh the best you know the best way to show that is showing a traditional method of therapy uh and seeing the results on that scale versus the application that you're developing all right and then one other which i'll try to squeeze in in the last minute because i think it's important um so do you have the same suggestion for sending pre-submission and usability plus feature tests um, apply to medical uh, device software that provide XR capabilities for fixed camera systems? Yes, and I, I wanna clarify that there a lot of people come in because it is coming in on a uh, somebody else's third-party system. They've They've, mentioned they're, they're, they want to come in as software as a medical device. Uh, software as a medical device is not an FDA uh, controlled term. Uh, we review things the, the, in the same way. We don't have any special considerations. Uh, so yeah, we, we would want to see that as well. Well, this, this has uh, been a wonderful talk. Um, it'll be up as a reference uh, for uh, innovators and researchers uh, to, to, to view. Um, I, I see someone's uh, just sent to heart. Uh, so the, the multiple 
multiple emojis to, 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 to you folks uh, from the FDA. Uh, I, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Ryan uh, for, for organizing this and uh, Ian, Alex, uh, Chris, uh, Larry, uh, uh, Michael, and, and Lisa for, for, for speaking. Um, it really does show the depth and breadth of uh, uh, the, the FDA um, uh, in the area of, uh, of XR, uh, and also uh, the, uh, the, the useful tools and, and processes that the FDA has put, put in place so that working, this, working in, uh, regulatory approval, if, if required, into a project is very, very feasible. Uh, and I, I look for, look forward to the next update. Uh, this is uh, this is fan fantastic. Uh, so thank you everyone and thank you to the attendees for for, for joining us. Um, uh, we, uh, we, 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 um, uh, we hope to see uh, this, uh, this wonderful work put to use uh, in the in innovator community. Uh, so see un until next time, uh, thank you. Yeah thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.